Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live stream. My name is Maz Barami from Wolfram Research. Uh, before we start, as a member of Wolfram Research family, I would like to wish you all good health. And I'm sure, you know, by helping each other in this difficult moment and taking proper measures, we can get <clears throat> we can take the effective actions against the spread of novel coronavirus. So what's our plan today? Today, we are going to computationally explore how a virus can spread and how some interventive you know, measures would influence its spread. Uh, this is going to be our first session, so we are going to have you know, a couple of more sessions on this topic. Uh, during these sessions, we shall focus mostly on compartmental models. They are a family of you know, models to, uh, <clears throat> sorry, to study you know, the spread of you know, any infectious virus. And uh, my guest today is Dr. Anton Antonov, uh, Anton, he's an applied mathematician with more than 20 years of experience in, you know, uh, coding, programming, and algorithm development uh, in most languages, especially Wolfram language. Uh, interestingly, let me mention that, you know, uh, I'm talking with you from Los Angeles, California, a beautiful rainy day right now. Uh, Anton, he's uh, joining us from Orn Orlando, Florida. Is it sunny there, An Anton, or... Yes, it is right it now. Is it is sunny. Yeah. So oddly, you know, California is not always sunny. So it's rainy. And uh, our team, our broadcasting team, they're helping us from Champaign, Illinois. So let's see, Anton, what we are talking about. So what are, you know, our uh, compartmental models? Um, yeah, thank you, Matt. Thank you for the introduction. Well, as you mentioned, compartmental models, uh, one way of, uh, of doing epi epidemiological uh, simulations uh, in this notebook, uh, what we see here, where I'm going to uh, explain or go through a particular workflow uh, of using this kind of um, compartmental models. Uh, and the target is, of course, we want to be able to, uh, to, be, um, able to simulate uh, the coronavirus propagation of the related COVID-19 disease. Um, the compartmental models, they are one approach, as you mentioned, Matt. Uh, the other approaches, uh, let me see, other approaches would be agent-based, uh, mm -hmm. some uh, cellular automata-based, and of course, mm -hmm. we can always do direct simulation, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. uh, if, we, if we're familiar with the process and we have uh, uh, good enough um, uh, programmers to, to do this direct simulation, meaning completely with code, not with... Mm -hmm. uh, not with using mathematical um, equations like what we are going to present here. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, beyond the scope of this talk to uh, discuss the, the theoretical background of the compartmental models and uh, how to, why, why they exist, what is the philosophical assumptions and etc. But I do, uh, I do think uh, this implementation here, this workflow is going to help uh, people to get uh, um, uh, acquainted better with uh, this kind of models. <clears throat> so, um, I mean, this is the, it's a, it's a very simple uh, workflow. Uh, I, um, before going through the workflow, I would like to say that there is a larger paradigm, at least in my opinion, called system dynamics. And with system dynamics, we, <clears throat> we have, uh, we follow the interaction between stocks and rates and loops. And so I'm going to use uh, some of the system dynamics uh, terminology when it comes to, to these models with um, the ep epidemiological models. The reason for this is that with system dynamics, I can uh, do extend these epidemiological models to, um, to do um, uh, economics-based uh, modeling and forecast predictions. Uh, mostly on the quantitative, qualitative side, but of course, we want to go at some point to the quantitative side. So first, um, with this workflow, uh, we're going to see, we get one of the uh, classical epidemiology models, um, and I mean the compartmental, compartmental models. We can uh, extend the equations in one way or the other, depending what uh, terms uh, we have in the models and uh, also, we should uh, you should take care of a certain theoretical consistency and prerequisites. Um, next step is to uh, work with the to, to select uh, appropriate initial conditions. 
I have put here for the populations. This means uh, the populations that play uh, a free, um, basic free, infected, recovered, and susceptible. Obviously, we have the total population, which is the sum of all of them. Uh, in uh, the more comprehensive models, uh, like what we're going to see here, there's a fourth population. This is the exposed, uh, the population of the exposed. So they're basically infected, but they don't have symptoms. They're not infectious yet. Um, Let me yes. just, you know, uh, add one, you know, one simple comment. Like, you know, these yeah. models, you know, as the name implies, you know, they divide the system into different compartments. And for each compartment, you know, we care about the change in population. Basically, right. you know, the variable that we track is, you know, how the population is change, changing. Mm -hmm. And what is important for us is that each compartment, how it influences the other compartment. And as Anton mentioned, you know, we have different compartments. You know, one compartment, there are people who might get sick. Another compartment are our sick people. Another compartment, those who are like, you know, have some serious symptoms and etc. Yes, and um, we can further do introduce more compartments based on age. For example, all the compartments you mentioned, they can be split uh, based on age groups. And so if you have five age groups, you have start with four compartments for infected, exposed, recovered, and susceptible. If you have five age groups, you're going to have 20 compartments altogether. And so different age groups, they interact in a different way. I mean, obviously, say younger people meet younger people probably through universities or, you know, um, sports activities or whatever. But very often through family, we also, of course, we're going to meet uh, other ages and so forth. So um, at least in principle, with these compartments, uh, this kind of separation gives us the mental framework uh, to divide and conquer the interactions between the uh, the the people in the society we're modeling and in that way we can produce uh, introduce certain structure which uh, is going to help uh, to build uh, more adequate models so um uh, this actually relates to this uh, interaction between the compartments it's exactly this we need to pick uh, appropriate parameters this can mean um parameters like say death rates birth rates in the, the society in general but also death rates because of the disease um, the so-called uh, uh, contact uh, contact rate, which is important for uh, for the compartmental models, uh, and uh, some other parameters we're going to uh, to see below. Uh, we, I, uh, with Mathematica, we can derive uh, from the equations we have produced, the ordinary differential equations we have produced for the for the model. We can uh, derive parameterized solutions. This actually is uh, an extremely convenient. Um, uh, way of um, seeing how uh, how the solutions are going to uh, to change their behavior, especially if we're trying to build up um, a qualitative uh, understanding of uh, of the moral of the moral and the system with the given initial conditions. Uh, this is what I'm going to be uh, showing below. Uh, interactive interfaces very important actually, because with the interactive interfaces we can see we can very quickly. Uh, see how, how things uh, uh, are going to be influenced by different parameters. Um, finally, we need to go, this kind of models, it's always a good attempt to try to calibrate them. Uh, even if we know that we're going to fail, and uh, even if the, because the model is too simple, it's still going to tell us something. So if we get some real data and we attempt calibration, we can actually see the limitations of uh, our modeling process. Or, we can judge to what degree uh, how adequate uh, these models are. So uh, I'm using a particular for this um, efforts uh, for modeling the coronavirus propagation and um, the related disease. I have uh, developed a relatively lightweight uh, uh, framework, uh, which has uh, different functions for uh, dealing with the models. For example, the, the general idea is that if I have uh, if I say uh, say something like a SIR model and I specify a time variable, I should get uh, this uh, this uh, this model, and I'm going to uh, to show how um, uh, how this uh, model looks like with a model table form, right? So this basically it's a, it's a simple it's a simple model. You can see I don't have initial conditions here. I have only descriptions of the of the populations, the total population susceptible, infected, recovered, 
I'm also very interested because I'm interested in the economics of the whole modeling. Although in the classical uh, SIR, SIR model, SIR is like susceptible, infected, recovered. This is what it stands for. In the classical SIR, SIR model, there is no money part, but I want to introduce it very early on in order to be able to, uh, to keep an eye of the, of the economics and to always be, uh, to have it available in the data structures I'm, I'm dealing with. So uh, here are the actual equations. These equations, you can find them in, you know, at this point, multiple books, articles, uh, websites. Uh, the model is fairly, is fairly old, probably at least 100 years old, and it has different extensions. So uh, what you see here, I'm going to, uh, what you see here, uh, it's, it's, it's a call in which I'm actually uh, calling a model called um, SI2. Uh, and the reason is SI2 is because I have two infected uh, populations. One is with normally, normally symptomatic, the other one is severely symptomatic. Again, this is tar we're targeting the coronavirus uh, uh, propagation, the uh, COVID-19 uh, disease. So we do have these uh, two populations uh, and uh, they're treated differently. You might, you might be hospitalizing the severely symptomatic people. You wouldn't, would not be hospitalizing the normally symptomatic. The question is what is the ratio between them? Uh, and so, uh, like, you know, we choose say some ratio, which is 20% and it's somewhere here, it's specified here. This uh, rate here, SSPF is 20% explains that. It's also, it's also explained here as a, in the dictionary of the model. So for me, the models I'm, I'm looking at, uh, this data structure, it's an, uh, in Mathematica, Mathematica has the structure association. So I have the associations or dictionaries, you know, in some other languages. So these associations, you can see stocks, rates, equations, rate rules, these are the rate, uh, rate values adopted in the initial conditions. We, this is what my model is. This is what I understand with a model. I don't see just one, or, just the collection of uh, equations. I do not see it as a model. For the mm -hmm. things I'm doing below, all of these elements are required in order to uh, to do simulations, interfaces, and solutions. Just All right. let me just, if you scroll up, let me just add, you know, one simple comment here down, you know, those uh, tables. Uh -huh. So basically, you know, as you can see, like, you know, I guess, you know, just to remind the people who are not familiar with the terminology. So stocks are basically, you know, the compartments and the classical compartments, SIR, you know, susceptibles, infected and recovered. And here, as you can see, like, you know, we have two more, uh, compartments. We break down, you know, the infected into two new compartments, and we also have exposed population. And then, you know, the next one that, you know, Anton is called rates, you can see them as a sort of interaction, the forces acting between different comp compartments, how these populations interact with each other. And then, you know, given that, you know, you have our dynamical equation and why Anton is, call, is saying that, you know, this model is a system dynamic because look at that, you know, we have a dynamical equation, time dependent dynamical equation with some initial condition. And our job is basically solving a system of differential equation. Yeah, right. So if I, I mean, to just illustrate what is happening, I mean, this is how the, the system is, uh, is being solved. This is how we have this uh, dynamic interface, which uses the, the, the system being solved. And if I changed uh, some, change some of the parameters, I should be able to see some changes into, into, the, into the graphics uh, here, right? So if I increase, increase, say, the fraction of the uh, severely symptomatic people, I mean, I should be seeing some, some changes. Also, if I, for example, change the time horizon, um, I mean, you can basically experiment with different parameters. I'm going to go back to the, uh, to what, uh, to the, to the program. So here we, I have taken the, this SARE model. The SARE model is provided by the package. It's, uh, it, it does generate the uh, uh, susceptible, susceptible exposed infected and I have these two infected populations. That's why I have I2 and recovered people. So uh, this is, uh, at this point, this is the most comprehensive uh, model in uh, this package uh, I'm using, but um, I plan to do uh, other models. I would like to say that it's very easy to, if you have your own, uh, if you don't wanna use this package, but you can wanna use the rest of the netbook, uh, of the notebook I'm presenting, uh, it's very easy to put uh, your models in this form. 
this uh, you can actually completely ad hoc construct them and uh, and utilize the rest of the notebook you do not need to use this uh, package here in order to retrieve models another way to use uh, to 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 come with new models is to just extend the models which are given and here i have shown uh, some examples of uh, adding uh, birth rates uh, the birth rate sorry the birth term uh, in which the birth rate is assumed to be the same as the death rate and another uh, another um, uh, extension would be for example to add uh, another population this uh, deceased uh, people uh, population is just a simple equation here you can see this is just a monitoring equation it does not interact with the rest of the compartments in it's it's just monitors what happens with the rest of the populations and it accumulates the value it in that regard it is very similar to the money uh, lost from uh money from lost productivity which is again just tracking the 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 people who are not participating in the workforce people who are infected or dead and uh and basically yeah and uh, multiplying it by some rates which we have uh, we which we have decided where it uh, reflects our money of loss of productivity right now here this uh, rate is 600 which in my opinion in my mind means 600 dollars this obviously this can be different we can put uh, the different populations at different tiers with uh, uh, different type of jobs and actually have more comprehensive uh, compartments from the from the perspective of what jobs uh, people are doing um, okay so further uh, this um, uh, this just shows that how we actually produce the actual the actual simulation equations uh, code I have selected um, a set of uh, focus parameters these parameters uh, the rates like this is the incubation uh, rate uh, this is the infectious rate infectious period and so this is these are the severely symptomatic um, population fraction and these are the contact numbers for the different uh, for the different infected differently the different infected uh, populations uh, I have separate, uh, I assume if you are severely symptomatic, your contact rate is going to be different. And uh, if you're not severely symptomatic, if you're normally symptomatic, again, you, it's going to be different. How different? How is this different going to, difference going to be modeled? Well, if you're severely symptomatic, if you're hospitalized, your contact rate might, might be uh, very small uh, compared to if you are severely symptomatic and not hospitalized. And in general, though uh, the severely symptomatic probably they have uh, higher uh, higher contact rates than the normally symptomatic people this actually it's a little bit of a question um, are the normally symptomatic people more likely to interact with others uh, do the severely symptomatic uh, people spread more and you know spread more like uh, fluids or or anything you know in which uh, uh, which makes them with high contact rate uh, this is a little bit of a question, but yeah, it, it is a good idea to uh, to separate them. Here I have used um, 58 million people. This is the uh, this is the population from Hubei, where is the city, the Chinese province in which Wuhan, uh, the city of Wuhan, is. Uh, I have done some kind of uh, other transformations here just to make the the models work. But um, this here, where I mean, you can see we have, I'm putting some concrete uh, concrete rates and concrete initial conditions and this is what the system which we're going to give to Andy solve or parametric and solve looks like so I mean I can do some other changes in a, in a, this in this manner I have this function set uh, rule race and set initial conditions in order to change uh, the model I'm I'm doing so far the changes are very very easily specified you just specify the the population or the stock you want to change and you you say the the new value and uh, the changes are going to be propagated here in this simulation given the focus parameters you can see i have derived the parametric functions so i'm getting different uh, different functions for the different populations like say for the exposed people i i see the parameters these are the focus parameters i selected here so we can see what andy solve uh, solve this system uh, parametric andy solve solve this system these are the parameters which have been selected these are the dependent variables which we have listed here with uh, this uh, with this uh, uh, with this operator and um, our independent variable is uh, in time which is here and you can see my time horizon is uh, one year so i'm doing simulation 
from uh, 0 to 365 days. And so here in this interactive interface, roughly speaking, what is happening, this, uh, uh, this solution here, the, the association which was produced here, is just being plotted. And so this interactive interface, it has a variety of uh, ways to uh, show different, uh, different parts of the data. We can put the plots uh, uh, together or not together. We can uh, do some, you know, uh, if, uh, if they're not together, I might want to, to spread them out uh, in certain way um, and so forth. And, uh, you know, the, similarly in some situations, like say, I might want to, to see the logarithmic plots for, for the money. Similarly, for the money, I might want to be. Uh, one, I might be interested in uh, seeing the derivatives. The derivative uh, means that, um, although because if we don't look at the derivative, this is the accumulated uh, the accumulated money from the loss of productivity. But if we look at the uh, derivative, and this actually shows uh, what are the what are the expectations of of losses. These are people not being available to work. If some decisions are made from this like say uh, stocks valuations or you know if you look at this as a as a demand uh, of uh, as a as an estimate of uh, the so called of the damage of the people not being presented this derivative might be might be more informative than the actual accumulated uh, accumulated value and similarly we we don't use uh, we don't uh, we don't usually look into the into the uh, derivatives of the populations and very often we plot them together and so for this particular a uh, particular model I'm, I'm showing, uh, it is beneficial to do it in, in that way. We can change, uh, for example, you can see I'm playing here with the, uh, with the infectious period, uh, how many days it is, like if it is, uh, say, uh, 32 days or 33 days, I'm going to have one, one, way, one, one type of behavior if it is, uh, uh, if the, um, the, the rate, the incubation period is four days. I'm going to have like much sharper peak here. I'm going to return uh, uh, back here to 0 0.2 in order to kind of see uh, the, the usual expected distribution mm -hmm. between severely symptomatic and normally symptomatic. If I don't want to, uh, if I don't want to disregard the severely symptomatic, I can just put this to zero. And then everything we see is just, uh, you know, it's just the normally infected. Granted, mm -hmm. You know the the rate with which the normal infected uh, are going to be uh, presented. You know, like you know, we might want to change it. Might want to play with different uh, different parameters here. Uh, uh, let me just ask you, Anton. Like you know, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. You know, so the first three parameters, you know, the average incubation period, yeah. average infectious, you know, period, and you know, mm -hmm. severely symptomatic population fraction. These are you know the features of this novel coronavirus. These are not the parameters that we can adjust. Although, like, you know, we might not know the actual numbers. Yeah. There might be some, you know, error in the estimation, but like, you know, these are the parameters that are beyond our control in a sense. Uh, correct. And, uh, but we, as you said, we don't know also. But we don't know, like, you know, what are the actual, for, for example, we, you know, the numbers yeah. that, you know, Anton has used the initial numbers, for example, 20% are severe compared to the normals, you know. <clears throat> These are the typical numbers that, you know, that we collected from the, uh, from the media. But right. the last two uh, parameters, the contact rates, mm -hmm. these are the numbers that will be, they, they highly depends on any measures that a government or right. yes. a population decides. Like, you know, those are the parameters that basically are under our control in a sense. Uh, right to a point, and also notice that we actually do have averages here. Like say, this average incubation period, average infectious period. I mean, this is these are averages. But you might say, look, actually using a, a constant rate, it's not that adequate. I would like to have, a, I would like to put a function. You know, in for example, mm -hmm. similar, same with the contact rates. The contact rates do, do not need to be constant. They can be actually say. You might have a piecewise uh, constant function, which is say 0 0.6, but after the government decided, ah, you know, we need to start doing something about it from, you know, from the first 20 days or when the coronavirus was uh, observed and the COVID-19 uh, COVID uh, mm -hmm. consequences were observed, uh, then we actually have a piecewise function which switches from 0 0.6 to 0 0.3, for mm -hmm. example. And uh, we can do this. 
we can do this with this uh, in this framework this uh, all can be uh, can be done i'm not going to be doing it in in this particular session but this is one of the reasons to construct uh, the models in this way and to have the ability it's one of the reasons is to to, to have the ability to change uh, the rates not to be constant but also to be functions yes. which uh, uh, derived from some data analysis so, so one the last I, mean, thing. I, I would like you know before you move on you know i would like to emphasize that you know uh, our users you know you can easily download this notebook from the community link that you see on the twitch tv and they can change you know all these variables and all these parameters you know that can be easily mm -hmm. implemented you know it's it can be done so here you know we are providing the workflow so that workflow can be modified by any user right uh so the last part of the workflow the calibration uh so here i have taken some real data using uh, i i haven't i didn't want to strain this notebook with the resource uh, function object but wolfram research provides uh, um, resources resource object with the monitoring of the COVID 19 and um, and i have taken just that from and i have referenced uh, uh, the, the the website for it here this is just for this notebook just for illustration purposes i have this uh, hard coded or whatever data which is just included here and um just uh, comment, he, these are the daily numbers like so yeah right each number so the day. This, this here i have changed the interface i was showing uh, above i have changed it to be uh, more you know in to be somewhat simpler and more and more ad hoc for for attempting calibration like say this here if i if i if i do uh, if i do this if i'm going to evaluate all these uh, functions here i might want to see what is the how i can actually my real data is this uh, dots they shown here recovered cases death deaths infected and my simulated uh, my simulated solutions uh, with uh, continuous lines so if I'm if I'm changing if I want to change uh, for example uh, to start uh, seeing um, yeah okay this was counterproductive and I guess I need to uh, do some uh, but I might I might try to to adjust uh, this first of all what I'm doing here I'm actually producing some offset about the data and this offset uh, it comes from from the simple observation but if I see what the if this is my first day first register date these are the 28 record people this means that at least one of these persons have passed the exposure and period and the infectious period this means that whatever is uh, my conjecture about the infectious in the like say in this particular case 38 days total this data probably needs to be offset you know and so that's why i'm doing these offsets i can further um, uh, do some uh, adjustments like this and um, so and uh, then try to see uh, how how well or how you know uh, how how uh, to in, in, under what circumstances i'm going to get uh, benefits so this is just manual adjustment i uh, i'm not going to continue doing this here but this is some of the in that way it's uh, how i have found uh, a few um, two sets of values which produce relatively good fit and so how good this fit is uh, it's probably another story but you can see from the fits uh, here uh i mean uh, also this is very simple model uh but you can see that um uh, we actually can compute uh, see the fit for first and say uh the other thing is that we can actually compare with the so-called reproduction number uh the reproduction number can be derived uh, in two ways one is computationally what is happening here from the theoretical standpoint and there is also from uh, observations and the actual uh, the actual theory behind this and so uh, ideally what we compute here as a reproduction number from this model with these parameters this is what our reproduction number is it should be close to what uh, what is has been estimated uh, from the empirical empirically from the observations with an alternative method uh, this this uh, reproduction number is way too high i've been told and that's fine I am not particularly concerned uh, with this this particular models what you see here don't work that well I it's not expected uh, to begin with uh, because this is just the first take it was very also a very simple manual type of calibration more complicated uh, automatic or semi automatic calibrations uh, can be done but definitely this calibration attempts 
uh, have to be have to be uh, performed, have to be observed. Uh, you know, we need to play with it in order to get acquainted with the model, with the uh, problem area, with the actual situation, and kind of uh, it, they should indicate in what direction we should uh, refine our models. Uh, so in so I'm going to return back to the beginning of this notebook where I was uh, discussing the workflow. We passed through all of this. We showed how uh, we can, I mean, I have a package in which I can take uh, uh, the classical epidemiological um, models, compartmental models, but uh, uh, this, uh, these models can be, uh, can, be, can be obtained in other ways, uh, in a much more ad hoc way, instead of using the package. The data structures which I have uh, utilized uh, uh, through association, they're being fed to uh, parametric and dissolve. The results from parametric and dissolve are uh, being used in interactive interfaces. And then I have another inter interactive interface, a simplified one, which uh, allows me to do uh, real data calibration. Okay, so uh, Anton, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I have one question for you. Like, you know, uh, what, uh, uh, where we can apply this simple model? Because definitely, you know, these models, they have some limitations. For example, you know, can mm -hmm. somebody apply this model, I don't know, for a state in, in the States, like, I don't know, California or Washington? Or um, uh, or right, so... The, the assumptions, the general assumptions in these models, and you can see it in the equations, is that um, uh, people uh, have, uh, they mingle with each other, right? And they have certain, um, certain patterns of interaction. And so, but this doesn't, doesn't necessarily apply that well in, uh, say, uh, countries or areas in which uh, the population is uh, very spread out and also very sparsely populated. The other thing is that, I mean, given what is happening right now with uh, people trying to work as much uh, from home, then many of this exposure, uh, uh, the this, sorry, not the exposure, the, the contact rates and um, some of the uh, other parameters, they probably change uh, because of the policies being implemented. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, roughly speaking, um, in some country, big country like um, China, United States, or Russia, uh, the, the assumptions of these models don't hold. I would say they would apply for a big city, mm -hmm. and uh, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't consider them adequate to be applied for uh, for you know larger populations. Uh, okay. So then let's say that you know if you want to you know extend it to you know model a, a country so how that extension can be done yeah well this is a this is a this is an example here this is a visual aid it's just uh, cities uh, very highly pop very big cities in china 30 cities in china and you know i'm not saying what this is about china but you know in general imagine you have this kind of uh, area in which you want to model i mean there this uh, this uh, sites or uh, geographical locations were pretty spread out, and obviously you need to take into account the uh, the traveling patterns uh, between them. Uh, one way to this is a very complicated uh, uh, notebook, not for this presentation, but one way to do that is to do a certain uh, special uh, special extension of the models, and this allows us to kind of see. Uh, some uh, uh, special geospatial temporal simulations of the of the of the of the disease spread, and so you can see here how, for example, the infected people have been uh, have been spread out from from the beginning of the from from uh, from one part of the mm -hmm. of the of the area, like say this one here. How there is a wave which kind of goes through and uh, mm -hmm. reaches mm -hmm. reaches the end. So uh, th this is a, a little bit of a uh, there are quite a lot of um, uh, considerations to do this. The the actual procedure is relatively simple, but actually mm -hmm. to uh, to justify it theoretically and to program it and to have uh, the numerical framework which uh, does uh, these simulations is a little. It can be a little bit of a challenge. I. Um, I do intend just to, to discuss this in a in a in a following lecture. 
This mm -hmm. is one way to extend these models. The other way is to actually look into the economics, which is something I've been mentioning here. I want to have much more comprehensive uh, uh, economical, economical variables here, like say num num number of hospital beds, because the number of hospital beds is mm -hmm. going to tell you how many people you can hospitalize. Mm -hmm. From the hospitalized severely symptomatic people, they are going to be less uh, less contagious. Or, you know, they you know their contact rates are going to be smaller. But the ones which are actually not hospitalized, what happens with them? What happens with the uh, if we don't have enough beds? You know, do we extend the beds? What are the money for new beds and so forth? Uh, so this is the the other way of extending the models. Ideally, at some point, both the both the economical part and the geospatial temporal. Uh, geospatial temporal models are going to be combined into one, and we can actually see how the uh, how how the propagation of the disease is being simulated, taking into account both uh, the policies taken from you know, from economical perspective, the damage economically, uh, what it has been done, and how it goes through how the the disease has propagated into space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Uh, so those of you who are listening to us, so in the following sessions, you know, we are going to discuss about the extension of this model, for example, how we can add, you know, geographical factor to this model, scaling this model to a country and what's going to be the results. Uh, I would like to thank Anton one more time for his excellent uh, lecture. You know, I really appreciate his contribution in a very short time. You know, he agreed to help us, you know, preparing, you know, this, this great notebook. Uh, remember that, you know, you can download the notebook from War From Community. If there is any question, you can directly interact with uh, Anton and us. Uh, you are watching, you know, our live stream on new coronavirus epidemic modeling using compartmental models. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Anton. Yeah, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Aaron.